era of superhero movies might be coming to a fiery and tragic end. Since the early days of black and white serials like The Mask of Zorro in the 1920s, superhero movies have been entrenched in Hollywood lore. But after over a century of masked crusaders gracing the silver screen, the genre shows signs of waning enthusiasm. In 2009, Disney purchased Marvel Studios. The movies got bigger budgets, better CGI, and in 2011, the world saw the Avengers on the big screen, and all was great until it wasn't. Despite the juggernaut success of Marvel's Avengers franchise, which has grossed over $7 billion worldwide, other offerings like 2021's Eternals have underperformed, suggesting superhero fatigue may be setting in. DC has fared even worse. The much maligned Justice League only managed $658 million globally with very few exceptions. In the Marvel Universe, we went for action movies with colorful humor to action comedies. The DC Universe did stay true to the whole serious, dark tone, but succumbed to the curse of terrible writing and repetitive reboots. And perpetual rebooting hasn't helped. By my count, 10 different actors have portrayed Batman across films and shows just since 1966. Be sure to tell us who your favorite Batman is in the comments section. Anyway, for whatever reason, the CGI started progressively worse. I mean, how did we go from Thor to the Marvels? Or from the Christian Bale's The Dark Knight to the first version of the Justice League, interesting of CGI? Or to the most recent Flash? At a certain point, we start to lose interest. Today, folks, we're diving headfirst into DC's Blue Beetle. Let me start off by saying that this is the first superhero movie focused on a Latino character, which is a noteworthy milestone. Having a diverse range of superheroes on screen can help more audiences feel represented. But is representing diversity enough in 2023? Variety notes superhero merchandise sales dropped an estimated 15% last year. Blue Beetle may not quite represent the definitive final nail for superhero movies, but its performance could certainly influence studios to either double down on bankable sequels or take more risks on unique stories. Let's dive straight in. The movie kicks off with our main baddie, Victoria Cord, portrayed by the ever-so-talented Susan Sarandon. She's the CEO of some mega-weapons company that's apparently in desperate need of a bug-looking piece of alien tech called the Scarab. Why? Well, it's supposedly going to revolutionize the weapon industry, or so they claim. Because nothing says world domination like a big blue space bug. Later we see our main protagonist, Jamie, played by Cobra Kai's Zolo Maraduena, return from college. Zolo Maraduena shines as Jamie, bringing his trademark humor and charm to the lead role. This was supposed to be a happy moment for Jamie, but it was short-lived when he finds out his family is bankrupt and facing foreclosure. The family provides some entertaining character moments, including Jamie's Uncle Rudy, a conspiracy theorist played by George Lopez, and his soap opera-loving, machine-gun-toting grandmother. George Lopez nearly steals the show as the quirky conspiracy theorist Uncle Rudy, providing many of the film's biggest laughs. Aside from finding out the family's facing foreclosure, Jamie finds out from his sister that his dad's heart was failing like a smartphone battery on a Pokemon Go binge, desperately clinging to life with a 1% charge. Speaking of coincidences that could only happen in a cheesy superhero movie, Jamie's sister hooks him up with a job cleaning the house of none other than the main protagonist. Because nothing says random plot twists like finding your superhero destiny while scraping gum and scrubbing toilets. In a moment that could only occur in the most absurd superhero movie ever, Jamie finds himself playing hero while keeping guard as his sister takes a legendary dump in the forbidden bathroom. He witnesses Jenny Cord having a heated family feud with her Aunt Victoria, and our brave custodial crusader steps in, telling Victoria to back off, just as his sister emerges from the toilet. Sadly for them, their employment dreams go down the drain as they're fired on the spot. And just when you thought this movie plot couldn't get any dumber, Jenny decides to thank Jamie for his heroism by giving him her number. She also casually invites him to swing by her company to see if she can magically conjure a new job for him. In a lucky turn, saving Jenny from the argument leads Jamie to a job interview and potential romance. The next day, our discount Peter Parker shows up at the Court HQ for the potential job offer and probably crack at Pretty Miss Jenny. With her family cheering him in such an endearing supportive display, however, I did find Uncle Rudy's rants and casual arson threats to be entertaining. While such moments can be wholesome and endearing, they tend to throw off the balance of the movie. It crosses over to family comedy with sparse action. 
The film's emphasis on the family's revolutionary grandma and financial struggles runs the risk of portraying Latino families through overused stereotypes. Disclaimer, I am not Latino, so please inform me in the comments if this film authentically captures elements of the Latino culture beyond the superficial details. So while Jamie enters the Cord building, Jenny, in a bid to sabotage her aunt's super weapon program code named OMAC, is stealing the Scarab, which it turns out is crucial to the success of the OMAC program, which we will learn more about shortly. Anyway, she hides it in some kind of fast food packaging and proceeds to hightail it out of there. Some burger-wielding lab guy notices and the building initiates lockdown. Jenny runs into Jamie, gives him the food packaging with the mysterious stolen item, and tells him to get it out of there, keep it safe, and most importantly, not to look at it for whatever reason. Of course, he opens it. After tossing it around like a hot potato at a barbecue, the scarab starts glowing, latches itself to Jamie in a hilarious moment that although was riddled with ridiculous death-defying movie logic and mediocre CGI, was quite entertaining thanks to great choreography, adequately believable acting, and George Lopez. Oh, this reminds me of that scene in Venom. But this isn't Venom, it is Blue Beetle. In this slightly over-the-top scene, the suit who, by the way, as it turns out, is named Kaji Da, takes Jamie on a wild joyride, zipping through the city skyline faster than rush hour traffic. The CGI wasn't all that great, and I just think overall the scene dragged on longer than a snail's commute in rush hour traffic. After crashing back to the house and realizing the scarab is stuck to his back, he sets out to find Jenny to see if she can help get it off, even though she explicitly told him not to open the package. I can excuse the bad CGI in this movie. Its budget was half that of The Flash. What's your excuse, Flash? My eyes! Jamie luckily spots Jenny and the two embark on the most anticlimactic action scene in superhero movie history, since that one scene in Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man 2 when Sandman got his powers. The guards at court start shooting at their boss, which doesn't make complete sense to me. Anyway, even though the car got shot up pretty bad, Uncle Rudy was not happy about that, by the way, the duo make it home safe. Here, Jenny explains how the Scarab is a planet destroyer and that it chose Jamie because he's the chosen one or whatever. In a tiresome loop revolving around the court HQ building, Jamie and Jenny must break into the building and steal a key that Jenny promises will help get the Scarab off. Am not sure why anyone would not want to be a freaking super beetle human, but maybe am the weird one. Even though the movie gives subtle hints at Uncle Rudy's conspiracy theory driven pseudo scientific character, I wasn't expecting him to be an inventor worth being taken seriously. So when he helped Jamie and Jenny enter the cord building by jamming their signal with El Chapalin, his homemade surveillance jamming machine mounted to a pickup truck, I was caught off guard. After retrieving the key, we get the first face off between the Blue Beetle and the Old Mac. There was a lot of explosions and robot-on-robot -robot action, but like most superhero movies do these days, the fight scene dragged on with no real value. Especially because even though he won by technical knockout, it would have been nice to see the Blades do some real work. This is another flaw superhero movies have. They dance between the lines of being family-friendly and being R-rated. There's more swearing in this movie than all four seasons of The Boondocks, so it's not a family movie. You gotta pick a side. Pick a side, people. Anyway, after spearing the old Max suit guy, Jamie's act of mercy is returned with attempted robotic homicide, but luckily Uncle Rudy saves the day. Side note, Jamie and Jenny have endearing chemistry, injecting dimension into their young romance amidst the superheroics. Another thing I've grown to hate about the new wave of superhero movies is how quick they run out of ideas. So, we soon find out that Jenny's dad was some kind of discount Batman Tony Stark. We know this because Uncle Rudy appears to have been a huge fanboy. Turns out he was the first Blue Beetle, although he never did get chosen by the Scarab. Then he disappeared. They also find out that the only way to get rid of the Scarab is for Jamie to kick the Beetle bucket. Next, we see Victoria Court attack the Reyeses, just in time for Jamie to swoop in and be soundly defeated, which he deserved with that boring, non-lethal fighting approach. Although, to his credit, he did beat up a couple of guys only to be taken out by the claw, mostly because he was distracted by his father's death, so we won't be too rough on him. Speaking of lack of creativity, why do we have another superhero whose true potential is unlocked after losing a father figure? I know I kind of made fun of the fact that Jamie's a discount Peter Parker, but if you think about it, he really is the DC Latino version of Spider-Man. Anyway, Jamie gets taken by the bad guys so they can suck the scarab code out of him. I know what that sounded like, let's just move on. Back in Jenny's dad's lair, the Reyeses find a bunch of superhero gear that they somehow know how to use. That's when we see Grandma grab a huge sci-fi gun and a mention of her revolutionary past. So I'm guessing she was a badass back in the day, that part left a lot unanswered. 
Uncle Rudy takes controlling of a high-tech beetle-looking spacecraft that he somehow knows how to operate, along with entire Reyes' family along with Jenny armed to the teeth. After impaling the bad guys in a display of violence we literally waited the whole movie to see, the beetle craft crashes to a halt. While having the scarab coat sucked out of him, again, we know what that sounds like, Jamie goes into the DC version of the ancestral plane. I guess we're borrowing ideas from Marvel again. Here he meets the spirit of his dead father who gives him an all-inspiring cliché, with great power, destiny mumble jumble. Not surprisingly, it works. He snaps out of the cum the sucking put him in, and then he runs. I expected to see an epic battle ensue, so I was a bit annoyed to see him run like a headless chicken. To make matters worse, he was saved by his machine gun wielding grandmother. By the way, after seeing her shooting all crazy and laughing like a psycho while she did it, I really want to see a spin-off with her as the lead. An epic battle eventually ensues, and we see everyone have their own badass moment, which would be cool if the movie was about a super family, but we don't get to see the full capabilities of the Blue Beetle. Well, either that or the Blue Beetle is the weakest superhero in the entire DC universe. So, the Omac, armed with a scarab coat, is a lot stronger than before, so during the epic fight, he wiped the floor with the Bug Boy. After watching Uncle Rudy seemingly get evaporated with a super robot bazooka beam, Jamie goes scion and beats the snow out of the Omac guy. But just when we think he's about to deliver some glorious R-rated action, Kajida stops him, sparing the Omac suit guy's life. Grateful or inspired by the act of mercy, the Omac guy walks into a fire with his boss, the main antagonist Victoria Cord, essentially killing them both. Although the movie ends on a high note with big hugs and inspirational words, I can't help feeling like I've lost an hour of my life. Honestly, Blue Beetle's director, Angel Manuel Soto, and screenwriter Gareth Dunnett Alcoser could have lost the superhero stuff and concocted a family comedy with these engaging characters, and this might have been a much better movie. Most of the audience stayed for the family anyway. In conclusion, Blue Beetle may very well mark the death knell of the superhero era as we know it. With action scenes that leave us yearning for something more, and a plot that's scattered in more directions than a superhero team-up movie, it's safe to say we've reached the end of an era. But the film deserves credit for advancing Latino representation in superhero cinema, thanks to authentic cultural elements and a tremendously appealing lead performance by Zolo Maradueña. But fear not, fellow viewers, for even as the era of the spandex-clad saviors crumbles around us, we'll still be here to dissect the wreckage. So, if you're as baffled as we are by the demise of superhero movies as we once knew them, hit that like button and subscribe for more content.